we should uh, start. I'm looking around the hall first to see if I can see. There's one additional seat if someone wants to come from the corridor over here. Can anyone, are there any in the North Jury Room? There are two over there. And there's one there. Uh, so anyway, okay. Um, what a pleasure it is uh, to welcome the distinguished sculptor, Anthony Gormley, uh, to the AA. Um, I'm not quite sure whether he has spoken here before, but certainly not for a long time. And it's 10 years ago. A great pleasure uh, to welcome you back. Um, I can tell, uh, partly from the packed character of the audience, um, that everyone knows Anthony Gormley uh, and to some extent his work. So I'm certainly not going to kind of list all his awards, titles, fellowships, prizes, whatever. Um, but in the purely artistic sphere, uh, Anthony was someone who studied at Cambridge before going on to study uh, art as a fine art, uh, both as an undergraduate and at a graduate level. Before then, I think it's, it's kind of forgotten how very quickly he had his own show uh, at the Whitechapel. And then really there started a kind of um, uninterrupted series of important works which continue. And the output really is kind of, to me at least, fairly stupefying um, and incredibly impressive. Uh, even those of you who haven't made a study of his work will know the sort of landmark pieces of the Angel of the North uh, and Another Place in the Sea at Crosby and uh, the, the, the work, I think, known as Figures. Um, but there's a vast amount uh, kind of in between those famous uh, works. Often Anthony is credited uh, with making a kind of long investigation of the relationship between uh, the body and space. I must say for myself, and I think sort of in a way, now that you don't see the term body used quite as much as you did, uh, in the 90s, it reveals that it's really, the, as I've argued before, uh, the figure and space. And this concern with the figure and space is a way in which, um, with figure and ground and the question of space, is, is one of the many reasons why his work is of such central and indeed like intense interest uh, on the part of architects. It is an investigation, it is a kind of, you might attempt it to kind of say in some parts of the work, a kind of artistic research into issues which then from time to time crystallize uh, as a distinctive work and one which is of enormous relevance uh, for architects. So I'm not going to say anything more about the honors, the lists. I think I ought to mention, of course, the rather the quite early winning of the Turner Prize, but I'll let it uh, stop at that. It's with great pleasure that I welcome Anthony. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mark, and thank you all for coming. It's amazing. This is a really full house. Um, 
I, I have to tell you, I told Mark earlier that I, I, uh, I was lecturing at Harvard to Moisan Masavi, the ex-director um, of this fine institution. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to use the same images. Uh, I realize that in a way I'm, I'm usurping on Mark's territory. I noticed uh, as I went down to the loo just a minute ago that there's a poster down there that says there's a series of five five uh, lectures that Mark is giving on the body, or anyway, the figure in architecture, that starts with Lea Kuhn and the Roadrunners. Is that right? Um, I, I, I'm obviously um, going to have to come to that lecture. So, um, the dialogue that I would have with, with Mark would be about what the distinction is between something we call body and something we call figure. It seems to me that the figure is something that is familiar within the academic tradition uh, as something that is put to work to tell a story. The understanding of anatomy, the understanding of the relationship between bone, muscle and skin is then the syntax that is put to work to tell narratives, mythological, political. And the figure in most of the history of Western art has been used to underpin the, in a way, the exercise of power. I'm interested in the abstract body, which I wouldn't call a figure. I would say that my interest is to try to reconcile the space of consciousness, which I think of as the darkness of the body, with space at large. In my view, there, there, there are really only two subjects worthy of the creative imagination, and they are, in a sense, getting to grips with what it means to inhabit a body, and what it means to make an environment in which that body can live and hopefully feel not simply protected, but extended. So, in a way, body and architecture are the two foremost, in my view, uh, relevant subjects uh, for the responsive and responsible creative mind. I'm also very aware of, and I think I need to just premise what I might say afterwards, um, with, a, with a, a kind of overview of uh, art's relationship with power. That curiously, modernity and if we take an exemplar figure like Mondrian, thought of art as naturally being a common, being a common ground that could affect people intellectually and emotionally, irrespective of race, creed, language. Now, how do we, how do we accommodate the, the fact that Mondrian in some sense has both been institutionalized and privatized. How have Mondrian's great ideals that stemmed from a spiritual tradition and became, in a way, I mean, he, he is, for me, a exemplar of the artist as self-determining individual who decides the terms of his labor and gives them meaning and, in a way, uh, potency through the one-pointed concentration that he gives his work. Now, how is, it, how is it that that work that was, in essence, about celebrating the idea of art as a shared arena, a shared field experience, that could genuinely be universal. How has that?
become somehow distant from us. Well, I think the, the, the interesting thing is that this, the whole story of early modernism, and I'm, I'm really thinking about the early, early years of the 20th century, has been sold back to us in the terms of late capitalism. And the rise of, in a way, what we now, in the post-Hurst years, recognize as the high material value of individual works of art, has happened at the same time as the ensuring of the recondite language of art that was attempting to be free and open and shared, uh, becoming, in a sense, the tool of exclusive uh, commercial exchange. So, one of my desires in, in making things is somehow to find a use value that liberates the, the thinking and, and, and the making into something that can be, again, common and shared. And I return to the body in the same way that Mondrian used red, blue, and yellow as the kind of primary syntax. I thought, I, I just, I want to go back to first-hand principles. What are we? We are embodied minds. Can we explore what it means to live inside a body? What does that mean? That means that we have to treat the body not as an object, not as the focus for idealization or putting it to work in terms of telling a narrative, but treat it as a place. And you might say this is a, a, a tricky thing for sculpture that is so much about materializing and forming to attempt. But I, I just want to share with you tonight some of the ways that I've tried to do that. And I thought we'd start here. So this is, this is a work uh, made in 1995, so about 20 years ago. And up to this point, I had, I had constantly been making molds of my body. I thought that it was silly to make another body, in a way the whole history, you know, Lea Kuhn onwards, uh, in terms of the excellence of facture within the sculpture was the ability to make another body. And I said, why? I already possess a body. This is my first experience. This is my closest experience of the material world. Can I not work on it, as it were, from the other side of appearance? The idea, I mean, the best way I can get this across to you is that I, I am aware that as I stand in front of you now, your face is your appearance, your presence as I look at you and your faces, belongs more to me than it does to you. We all live in that space behind appearance. How, how, how can you begin to articulate that fact? We could, we could try it now. I mean, if we just close our eyes, it's a very simple, you know, practical thought experiment. Where are we? We are now in a... Uh, don't feel shy, just do this because it's quite interesting. What, what are the determining conditions of us now? We are subjectively experiencing, as it were, being without a bounding condition, which has no edge, it is dimensionless, and seemingly could have infinite extension. Okay, 
how do we how do we link the truth of that highly subjective but also universal experience of dwelling within this space that is embodied and yet has this reality of in a way or potential of infinite extension and how do we begin to reify or make an objective correlative of in a way being in a body well my my shortcut to all of that was let's let's try to take the event take the event of a lived moment in time and register it completely leaving out in a way that 500 year or whatever with that starts with the brothers Pisano of making another body let's stay with the body that we have and try and register it so it's no longer forced into verisimilitude because it already has it it is not symbolic and it's not really an image it's an index you know in Percy's three categories that idea of index the empirical trace of something that really existed and a time that has passed but really happened and that's what we have here here is for the first time in my work this was in the early 90s the transfer of using a mold that was as it were the evidential proof of as it were this registration this indexical proof of a lived moment and making the space within that mold uh, a mass so this is 630 kilos of iron that 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 same material that we would find if we went vertically into the core of the earth poured at the same temperature that we find at the core of this planet this is the this is what gives the planet its mass and keeps us on our trajectory through space gives us our magnetic field now used to identify a human space in space you can maybe see how the 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 story of its manufacture is inscribed on its surface so these pale lines are simply where the loose pieces in the in the in the uh, sand mold were were brought together you can see on its surface Vic there's a chair yeah, here yeah, okay um, the traces of the cling film that covered me when I was molded you can see also here is one but there are there are there are four of there are four others on the face and another four on the back these buttons that are the place where the incoming ingates of molten metal entered the mold so in a sense the only narrative that you might derive from this object is the story of its own making its ontology but what is it doing it's not doing very much it's sensing its environment it's a body that has conformed as it were to the dictates of architecture if we think of Mondrian back to Mondrian this is this is me identifying through the body in a way those primal Euclidean vertical and horizontal axes and the and the corner as the in a way the point of intersection of XYZ it's not doing its being but in being it's sensing its environment this is in a way close perhaps to the caryatid except this is a caryatid that is slumped it's no longer as it were carrying the weight 
Um, what happens when we acknowledge that we are in the time of mechanical reproduction? Can we withdraw that notion of the unique art object that somehow is the result of this journey to realization that, is, that comes through facture? And can we, in reproducing it, somehow turn its inertia, its inherent inertia, its accepted inertia, into something rather like a catalyst that becomes, in a sense, a way of making active the presence of the viewer. So that the viewer, rather than being, as it were, the done recipient of the genius artist's self-realization, is involved in something reflexive. And that's really what I'm trying to do here. So, in fact, there are eight of these body forms that are distributed at the eight corners of a standard white cube gallery space that is otherwise left vacant. So, what happens to the body of the viewer? The body of the viewer ends up taking the privileged position that formerly the naked Venus would have taken on its plinth. The idealized, sexualized body of a mythical, in a way, imagined perfection. And the viewer's body, in some senses, hopefully, begins to register the fact of its enclosure within this architecture. And I think um, maybe, maybe it's, too, it's too much to expect, but my, my attitude to this is that I'm wanting to allow the work to begin to underpin and interrogate us as subjective experiences of space and time, the reality of our environment. And, and in terms of architecture, we know that I think architecture wants, you know, whether you're talking about you know, the monolithic architecture of Egypt or you know, the classical orders of, of classicism, or indeed the, the, the kind of élan of Gothic architecture. It wants us to believe in its permanence, in its hold on place. And I guess I'm wanting you to think about the fact that actually there, even though architecture wants to reinforce our sense of, in a way, uh, certainty and the power that underpins this made environment and the idea that it should have continuity. I'm rather wanting to do the reverse and to free this room from that determinism, to make you uncertain about which way is up, to reinforce the fact that actually, given everything we know, whether it's Newtonian cosmology or quantum electromagnetism about the truth of the relationship between mass and space and that actually nothing is fixed you know that this planet is spinning around its own axis at 1470 kilometers an hour that we are turning on our circle about the sun at about 104,000 kilometers an hour but those sort of figures mean very little when you compare them with what the sun and this solar system has done in terms of its journey through space around the galaxy. We've done about 20 circuits about our galaxy, our solar system at the edge of this spiral galaxy. And we're traveling about 828,000 kilometers an hour. But that, in a way, has very little real purchase on the truth of what is now called the Hubble constant, that truth of the dimension of space itself 
ever growing, that every 3.25 million light years, we all clusters of mass that is held together by gravity are moving apart from each other at the astonishing speed of 265,680 <coughs> kilometers an hour. Anyway, I mean, I don't want to blind you with the science, and I have to always write these things down because I can never remember the... Um, but the, 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 the basic thing is what, 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 what the body in sculpture particularly did in its history, and we see it here down Whitehall, the totemic objects of this particular tribe are stilled and idealized the stilled and idealized bodies of military heroes, usually, that are raised on high as moral exemplars that, in a way, suggest an implicit division between them as reinforcers of the status quo of the power of, in a way, those that determine the future, and us as mere street dwellers. I'm very keen to reverse that and reinforce the sovereignty of the individual perceiver so that it's actually the subject of your experience as you enter this room and hopefully make your own orbit around it to find your place in the center and think about your position in space time and how it is mediated through the environment that encloses you. So, um, are there other ways? I'm just going to show you a few other projects that deal with the same, I think, basic idea. Can we turn art from an object of high monetary exchange into an object of, in a way, experience? Can we into, into uh, a thing uh, that catalyzes our in a way, present, first-hand, physical experience of where we are. So here is a work called Clearing, which um, this is as it was installed uh, at the White Cube in uh, about 10, 12 years ago. This is uh, it's about five kilometers of endless 18-millimeter uh, square uh, bar that is like a great big physical scribble. Uh, here is the gallery now turned into another kind of compression chamber or testing ground for human experience. Uh, I took Cy Twombly to this and he, uh, and he wouldn't cross the threshold. I said, Andy, you made a really lovely web. Uh, I said, what, Si, come, come on in, you know, because it's really quite cool in here. It's kind of, you know, you, you touch a bit and, and the sound goes whoosh, all around. And, and, and anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a picture. The inbuilt, I think, attitude that we have to art is that, in some senses, it is untouchable and unenterable. And I guess, you know, for me, that crossing of the threshold is a really important thing. And in terms of what the comments that, that Mark made at the beginning of this, to introduce this lecture, that issue of figure and ground, the issue of the degree to which we are prepared to accept other people's representations to the exclusion of our present experience is, I think, the tragedy of art, you could say. The degree to which we are prepared to become the dumb receivers struck into an awed acceptance of an other's image is the degree to which we deny our own participation and attend to our own present feelings, thoughts, and experience. Anyway, so 
the idea here is that you do cross the threshold and that you begin to make your own, again, orbit or trajectory through this Euclidean, again, room uh, or room that is constructed through the principles of Euclidean geometry but is now denied by something that, you know, you might say is an evocation of the wave-particle di dichotomy. Um, the choreography of the viewer in some senses becomes then the viewed for other viewers. So this, this, this interruption of the arena of the gallery in which the unique object is usually you know, presented, isolated and specially lit suddenly becomes a testing ground for present time yeah, palpable experience and, 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 and the viewer becomes the viewed for other viewers. And this thing becomes, in a way, a, 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 yeah, it's an open field in which the viewer is no longer dumb and uh, passive, but actually has to negotiate. Um, I just want to show you this, this uh, is this going to run? Is this where I do it? Just click the, just click on here. Um, oh, there we go. So this is, this is um, the same thing actually uh, installed in the basement of the Palazzo Strozzi, um, which is not a bad place to try and undermine <laughs> the certainties of architecture. Um, but I just, uh, this is just taken on a phone. But but to give you an idea of how, in a sense, uh, the viewer's body uh, has to mediate and modify uh, his or her experience in order to sense, in order, well, first of all, you have to cross the threshold, but then you have to, in some way, explore the field. You have to become the figure in the ground. What is the ground? The ground becomes, in a sense, this mediation. That's the kind of sound that I'm interested in as well. The, the, the acoustic dimension of sculpture has become increasingly of interest to me. Um, I don't think we need to dwell on the whole of this. Um, so I've shown you two, two uh, kind of testing grounds that, that, that use, as it were, the, the context of display, the, the art gallery, and try and turn it, turn it into something proprioceptive. This was, this was me, in a way, challenging that idea of uh, what happens on Whitehall, the idealization of the plinth, the plinth that implicitly says uh, these are higher values and you li live on a lower, lower plane, we are somehow uh, reinforcing the status quo. Can we reverse that? Can we put, as it were, life as it's lived on the higher plane and become, as it were, um, participants in the representation uh, of now, of ourselves. This is the project called One, One and Other, um, which basically took the, the plinth that was made in the mid-19th century for, for William IV um, and it was supposed to have a four times life size equestrian statue of the king on it. Um, nobody loved him enough to pay f uh, for the subscription, so it was never, never made. And uh, this has now, for the past 12 years or more, been the site for uh, contemporary, uh, temporary inhabitations. Anyway, uh, this was a project that I um, eventually succeeded in doing, which was to occupy that space of idealization um, by real life by offering an hour to 2,400 people, an hour at a time, 24 hours a day, rain and shine, continuously for, for 100 days. Um, the hours were distributed uh, 
demographically and the um, so London I think had something like uh, 270 hours the whole of Wales, I think, only had 72 hours, but uh, this was entirely to do with population and population distribution. Um, what was this trying to do? I think what we were trying to do was, uh, again, think about sculpture as a, a potential space of active involvement. And here, now, the, the viewer really is the viewed. Um, this was the opposite of uh, a, I suppose, a TV reality show. We didn't, we, the, the, the way that people were chosen was not on the genius of their ideas. We didn't, we didn't uh, need to hear what they were going to do. They were chosen entirely uh, randomly um, once the hours had been distributed from, from those that had applied. Um, and some chose to use that hour for agit prop. But some, and those, those are the ones that I found most telling, just carried on their daily lives on this place of idealization. And so here is somebody just putting up their washing. But what was interesting about this was how immediately the life on the square became involved in questioning. In, in, yeah, this, this, the look on this woman's face, I think, says it all. What is happening here, and what does this mean to my assumed values? And of course, there was an enormous and wonderful amount of humour. Um, you know, whether this is kind of late um, women's liberation, uh, an incredible creativity in the way that people prepared their props. The, the same thing that I was hoping for withdrawn, the eight pieces in the, in the, in the corner, happened now spontaneously with this, yeah, this in a way, incomprehension, which often was followed by empathy. So people concerned about, in a way, the world that they thought was stable and predictable, being somehow undermined by things that were confusing. But that those things became resolved in a way, usually by talking to either the person that was sitting next to you, standing next to you, or, or the friend that you'd brought along to see what was happening at that moment on Trafalgar Square. And anyway, I, th I think you know, this, 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 this work continues to interrogate me in terms of what is possible, what is possible in terms of this interface between event and object how can we how can we engage as it were real real time and real life in uh, meditating upon itself this was a, a really extraordinary uh, I mean I could show you that the, 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 the entire 2400 hours are now archived uh, by the British Library so if you want to immerse yourself in this uh, just go one another uh, after you've gone to the British Library and, and you, yeah, you can see the whole thing. Obviously, the, the, uh, what was extraordinary was how people responded to the idea of their one hour of fame, as it were, because some thought, well, I have to, I have, I have to be the voice of a serious cause or I have to memorialize, I have to think about the fallen in Afghanistan. But this, this girl, who was afraid of heights and agoraphobic, was released from her, uh, you know, we had, a, we, we had a articulated forklift that 
delivered people to the, to the plinth and immediately went into this sort of catatonic position and could barely bear the exposure to the public gaze but became in a way a for me one of the most potent uh, icons of those 2400 hours so if that was you know in a sense the exposure of the of the idea of the viewer becoming the viewed and and and, and the participatory using in a way the frame the frame of the of the plinth can we think about architecture abstractly so this is, this is me going back perhaps to something that I was trying to do with drawn here is uh, again this is back at my gallery white cube this is the white cube space at, at a mason's yard I've taken 20% uh, of the gallery space which worked out at about 120 cubic meters and made 15 frames that each contain that 120 cubic meters but stretched each frame in a different axis so that they interconnect. On the floor you have a kind of map, a plan, a mandala if you like. This is made of, of uh, very lightweight uh, aluminium dexian tubing, 25 mil square painted with photoluminescent paint and when you come into the gallery for most of the time for 10 minutes at a time you are in darkness it's very meditative but then for 40 seconds 70,000 lux of brilliant light goes on each of those each of those light sources is a, a thousand what quartz halogen light so the dialectic here is between in a way the meditative and the interrogative the light is so bright the heat in the room goes up very swiftly you can see the veins underneath people's skin you can see how many layers of makeup they have on the 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 there was always a, a shock in a way when um, when people came in, this is a this is a, a little video of, uh, and time becomes a very a important structure. Again, the acoustic in this was very pretty, and people negotiate space as a child might negotiate floor. And you're confronted with this forest of luminous lines that seems to stem from a, a map on the floor, which makes you actually have to be very careful about where you put your feet. transition I, I was expecting people to leave after the that blinding light moment but in fact quite the reverse people settled in and wanted to see as it were what the fly executor kind of effect was going to be on further people so that this this room became more and more crowded and it was just I mean Forgive me, Mark. This is over over the top. But if you if you think of that Piera della Francesca um, like ideal city image, in which perspective is first 
used to extraordinary effect to make us imaginatively think about the built environment. I suppose for me, um, Breathing Room, which is the name of that, of that work, attempts to allow the viewer to become the flagellated Christ, or anyway, the, the scene, and, be, and make the architecture into, in, into, a, in, in, into a way this, this, this place of reverie in which the viewer yeah, changes from being a silhouette, in a way, a, a ghost moving through a dematerialized architecture to being then the interrogated victim within a highly confrontational, highly luminous environment. So I just want to end with two other projects. Um, this is a, I suppose this is, this is a machine for direct democracy. So this is, this is um, taking my idea. The plinth is seven and a half meters from the ground. This is a uh, suspended floor, 50 meters long, 25 meters wide, uh, with a, uh, suspended by eight cables. It has an oscillation of 0. Uh, eight hertz, and it can swing about two meters, a uh, hundred people at a time. This time, this is the collect collective body that is raised uh, above the common ground. Um, this is it in in motion. Its its top surface is um, a black mirror made of uh, six tons of black polyurethane. Um, any individual can move it. So that dialectic between, as it were, individual freedom and collective context is in constant dynamism. The body of the individual is qualified by the movement of the group and vice versa. And when this thing is really swinging, on the whole, that dialectic between the viewer and the view changes. It's the young people, uh, on the whole, who are dancing and trying to stand on one leg, and the older people who are sitting down watching. Um, this is this is just a a, a short uh, indication of how we made it. We, we this this was a work that had to be made within the gallery. Uh, so the gallery was transformed into not just a testing ground for the viewer in the end, but a but a place of 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 making uh, the museum absolutely not. Uh, the treasure house, but absolutely the engine of new production. Uh, transmitted by this is this is other the most room. important thing to see. If you can just see how the the entire surface is basically making the certainty of architecture suddenly uncannily uncertain, and all of the relations between, you could say, late Northern Romanticism, uh, the idea of John Dee's dark mirror, the reflexive surface, in some sense is allied to the idea of a common playground. Again, in an arena in which the viewer and the viewed uh, come together. The, um, the windows that were at eye level were removed. Uh, the, the, the obscuring film was removed from them so that they became clear. And from, from this platform that was in the world but somehow not of it, you could look out at the city that you had left. So this again is an inversion. So now the museum becomes a place from which you look at the world rather than uh, to which you isolate objects from the world. And uh, I like this slide because of what's happening. So that couple in the top right are looking out and he's probably explaining to her, you know, where he works. Um, you've, got, you've got kids, you know, um, playing, playing um, tag. Uh, you've got other people just lying and feeling this um, curiously calming swaying of this enormous uh, surface. Anyway, I, I didn't know how it was going to work, but this was another experiment that in, in some senses became a testing ground for what, for what art could be. You could conceive of this as being a vast black monochrome 
which literally was the ground on which the viewer became the figure. Blind light. A box that is filled with a cloud, 2,000 lux of light, a cloud at one and a half atmospheres, a threshold permanently open. I was amazed that people were prepared to queue up to two hours to experience this thing. Uh, it, yeah, you could criticize this as being a, a fairground uh, experience. But actually what happened was you were intensely alive, aware. I think you're officially gone. You became a <laughs> disembodied eye. You couldn't see your own feet. You couldn't see your hands when you held it out in front of you. But you were immersed in this luminous cloud through which bodies would appear, but only when they were well within your in a way, intimate body zone. And, yeah, for me, this was maybe the closest I got to this reconciliation of, if you like, the space of the body and the collective space of architecture. The, um, the body of the participant became images for people on the outside. And that idea of very frightening being disappeared for but, yourself. But, but good. Not knowing where you're going. <laughs> where the walls are. <laughs> now not knowing where you're going. It's a bit it's a bit um you lose yourself on purpose, isn't it? So I'm going to end with, I think, the work that comes closest to reconciling the idea of the two trajectories of my work. One, which I seem to have concentrated on tonight, making, uh, in a way, environments or situations in which uh, the viewer becomes aware of their own present first-hand experience, and the body as a, in a way, materialized uh, indexical uh, image. And this is, uh, this is a work called, and probably cl comes closest to your field of architecture. So this is a work called um, Model. Uh, it's a prone body, but the volume of the body has been translated into now these rectangular boxes made of Corten steel. Here's the model of what you've just been looking at in the front uh, of this slide. You can see it's 24 boxes, three of which are open and allow light into the interior. This was an allied space within the, within the uh, exhibition as a whole that showed other models. Um, it just fits within this space that's 35 meters long and uh, about 20 meters wide. Uh, there is only one point of entry, but there are many, as it were, um, invitations to explore voids, which is what you saw in previous slides. This is the, the one point of entry. And here we are going into that right foot. Interestingly, this is more or less the size of a standard threshold. You're faced with this um, lum luminous reflection within the steel. And then as you turn that corner, you go into total darkness. What I was interested in was how there was a difficulty in deciding whether something was a threshold or a wall. 
and you had to use you had to use your acoustic sense like a bat to get an idea of the volume of the chamber that you were in light was let in through those three open uh, boxes and you had to in some senses negotiate making sure that um, that you didn't either um, bump your head or end up being uh, trapped. The right hand side of this slide for instance is actually a void. There was a large space in there of about uh, three meters by three meters by two meters high. A few people found it. From that, from that vantage point, you could watch people coming in. I think this was an attempt to re-enchant the notion of architecture and, in a way, allow you to think, as a child would, about the affordances of spaces that were utterly unfunctional but again constituted by the absolute geometries of vertical and horizontal surfaces. Again there was this opportunity to kind of uh, uh, see people held within this indirect light and throughout the, throughout the piece you would encounter as in blind light other bodies often in situations that you wouldn't normally find them in a gallery. The, the way in which people engaged, as they had done with, with Horizon Field Hamburg, the idea of first-hand palpable perception of their environment was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I just want to... Um, give you an idea of the acoustic environment. Um, the, the whole thing is made of uh, we're in a interconnecting chamber uh, with a consistent skin of eight millimeters that is hovering above the floor because the floor isn't flat on tiny spaces. The whole thing is reverberant. So as you move through, you're aware of other bodies moving in other parts of this, in a way, surrogate body. The The reconciliation of what you know and what you're experiencing, what you have seen from the outside but are now, as it were, immersed in. The relationship between memory and anticipation, the dealing with fear, the fear that previously had been perhaps about being on this unstable platform seven and a half meters from the ground is now the fear of having entered a space that you're not clear about how you're going to escape. Um, all of those things reconciled in some senses by these vignettes of, in a way, other bodies that might be occupying the space in other ways. The, the final chamber you access through the right hand side of this slide and it's simply a dark space that is in fact the head that's five meters by about three and a half by 220 high. In it the only light you get is indirect. And in a sense you know I, th I think that this is the final kind of uh, impression chamber or reflection zone and when you're in it, you can sense the totality of that collective body that, in a, way, in, a, in a sense, is exploring the bits that you cannot see. Um, that's where I'm going to end. Um, I think the, the project is ongoing. As you can see, there is 
very little formal consistency in what I've shown you. But I think my ambition is to return art into an instrument through which we can interrogate our present time and first-hand being. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for one or two questions. Hi. <laughs> I, mean, I like you show the process, so I just wonder you personally or spiritually or philosophically, how did you feel you have changed as a person, like when you are uh, interacting with the space or anything? I think uh, basically in terms of anxiety, I think that a lot of the a lot of the early work was about trying, in some senses, to, uh, to accept uh, vulnerability and make a, uh, yeah, make a, I, I suppose, make, make an image of something that was, that was not about power, but probably more about fear. And I think what's happened through the years that I've been making is that, that that fear has changed from being something that I'm in, 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 in some senses trying to uh, face and recognize to being actually a positive, a positive energy in, the, in, 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 opening, in opening myself and others to, to, to this idea of I suppose, reflexive first-hand experience. So, I, I mean, if I look back at, uh, at my, my work f of the last 30 years, I think that, that I think you, you, you see something that is very hermetic and, and uh, I think, sort of dis distant, and now it's become... I, I think porous and more open. Freedom. Freedom is a very difficult word these days, um, but I would like to think. I would like. Yeah, yeah. No, I would like to. I would like to think that 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 now now there there it's not about you know it's not about confrontation with image. It, it is about liberating, you know myself and and the viewer into a zone of experience that is yeah free I I used to m make everything uh, and now I work with a team of people so they're about Twenty of us in the studio, oh, uh, and of those twenty, I would say ten are makers, uh, and the rest are, you know, organising or helping the makers do what they do without interruption. And yeah, I've, I think I've, I, I sort of now work through people and in the old days yeah you know, i guess yeah you know, i i i would make my work and i felt that that was what i had to do i now feel that i have to listen to the work and in some senses it's it's making me it's telling telling me and the people that i work with what to do next 
and it leads us in in places to, to places that we couldn't have. I mean, I couldn't have conceived making model even three year, years ago, but it became absolutely uh, inevitable uh, once we started to, in a sense, kind of interrogate these these architectural idioms because we we. Yeah, I, I, I missed out a lot of the. I, I could have given you another talk where 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 we followed the trajectory that you could say started with withdrawn the the eight figures in the corner, and slowly absorbed, if you like, that idea of um, the the articulation of space through rectangular um, modernist um, forms into a, a yeah instead of making filling a mold with with one uh, pouring of molten iron filling a mold with pixels physical physicalized pixels of of blocks of steel which were joined together anyway there was a period for about um, six years where we did that and the pixels got bigger and uh, from having had their own in a way in in uh, proportional relation one to the other, they started having self-determining relations until we were translating the volumes of the body into masses, and it was the relationship between those masses that gave the feeling, not the original um, mould. And uh, then we decided that we would evacuate those masses because they were all, I mean getting on to being the same weight as the original 630 kilos. And we thought, you know, and once, once, we, once we evacuated those masses, they then became exactly like buildings or, or rooms. And then it became logical to actually make those rooms experienceable. So you could say there's an there's a incredible logical uh, kind of development in this, but it's determined absolutely by the work and by making the work and experiencing the work and deciding what the next step should be. There's a question over there. Can, uh, hang on. Hello. Um, I was interested in the um, last project which you showed, which um, I was wondering if there was an element where someone could transgress, where they could climb on the structure instead of um, and find their own way in through one of the openings, perhaps. Yeah. Um, my niece did that at the opening, <laughs> and uh, no, I was very keen. No, I was very keen uh, that you should treat it as much as a landscape as a as a as a containing space but unfortunately uh, in our risk averse uh, insurance kind of articulated notion of um, responsibility institutional and otherwise um, people were were um, actively you know, dissuaded from climbing on it. But the, the, I, I was very, very keen um, and indeed climbed all over it myself because there were some marvellous, there were some marvellous prospects from above where you could look down and indeed observe people uh, fumbling about. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. And in an ideal world, I think that it should be completely open. I mean, what's, what's extraordinary in those in these situations is that it's always it's always children that teach us how to experience. And certainly, it was the children that, that first kind of realised on Horizon Field, for example, that you could bounce on the ends and turn these wonderful kind of sine waves through the whole structure. This is something that the engineer hadn't realized and got very concerned about. He was, he was principally worried about them destroying the building by making 
uh, the thing swing too much, um, but hadn't realized that actually the cantilever on the very end um, could be exploited very effectively. Um, uh, and uh, the whole thing started sort of... Um, but anyway, um, the, truth, the truth is that, that uh, I would love it uh, for people to climb all over this thing and find uh, the top route in, uh, but it wasn't possible uh, in the Bermondsey showing, but it may be later. Thank you. Is there another question? Okay, uh, the, this, let this then be the last sure. one. Yeah, quickly. Um, because it kind of follows up the other ones. I was wondering um, um, if you could say something more about the uh, material characteristics of the surface. Because I noticed that, for example, in your first project and also in the last one, those have a very determining role, uh, being the facture, or in the last one, the acoustics. Um, so I was wondering if you maybe have some kind of um, fixed set of ideas about how you work with these material characteristics, or has that evolved, seeing how um, the viewing subject reacted to previous works? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a bit of both. I think it's, you know, I. I've used everything from, yeah, uh, water vapor to bread to uh, uh, to steel to iron to to, to stone, um, and I think every every material has its own valency, has its own affordance. But part of, I mean, one of the things is to kind of find the right balance between, you could say, uh, what your what you're inviting people to experience, and the and the and the material reality of of, of the medium, but I uh, I've got more and more interested in actually that relationship between you could say total ephemerality and and uh, absolute determinism. So uh, you know, on the one hand, I'm very very interested in making more and more work that is in a way to do with social exchange so uh, making uh, making spaces in which uh, secrets or lies can be transferred uh, at the same time as that uh, I'm very very interested in in, in, in in making things that I know unless there's a kind of atomic holocaust will will last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, the, I'm very attracted to industrial processes because they escape from, from the, the, the determinism of bronze or, or oil paint, for example. So I like, I like to... Uh, yeah, uh, use methodologies that come from the industrial revolution, from shipbuilding, from from road building, from uh, cast concrete. Uh, yeah, the, the the vernacular of the built environment now used to make, if you like, psychological architecture or instruments of interrogation but I yeah I think uh, materials are there to be uh, to be tested themselves and I, I don't I, I would like I wouldn't like to think that I uh, that I limit I think I limit myself to uh, to any one particular material but it has to be said that over the last yeah over the last 10 years I have tended towards the ferrous uh, rather than um, yeah, water or uh, mud or uh, wood, for example. Okay, um, on behalf of the audience, well, thank you. Thank you.